Hey, if you've got a Bible there, can you open with me, please, to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I'm just going to pray really quickly. Father, I just pray right now, Lord, would you open our eyes to see something that we haven't seen, God. Lord, open our ears to hear what you need us to hear for this morning as we open up your word and as we uh, look at and try to comprehend and grapple with what was heard by these original hearers when they first heard this stuff spoken, God. So, Holy Spirit, just move upon our hearts, transform us, change us into the image of Jesus, we ask. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Uh, Acts chapter 3. Hey, we, we've been talking um, the last sort of, I guess, few weeks about uh, the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, and yes, I say person because if you go back and you look at these ancient documents, uh, Jesus, when he spoke of the Spirit that he was going to send, he never spoke of the Holy Spirit as a power. He never spoke of the Holy Spirit as just a thing. He always spoke of the Holy Spirit in terms of personhood. Uh, when he comes, uh, I will send him. Uh, Jesus spoke of the Spirit as being a person. Jesus said, when I go, another one will come, uh, uh, one of the same kind as me. Uh, the attributes of the Holy Spirit, without sort of bogging down right now in it, we read in this collection of ancient documents that the Holy Spirit speaks like a person. The Holy Spirit leads us like a person does. That uh, uh, the attributes of the Spirit are very much like the attributes of, of a human. So when we think of the Holy Spirit, it can be easy to just think of some unseen sort of magical force that whisks into the church. A little bit like any Star Wars fans here. Any Star Wars fans? I knew that that's bad. See, here's the thing with Star Wars fans, right? None of you want to admit it until somebody else does. I noticed that. Lockie did. And everyone looked around and went, oh, it's cool now. Hey, it's always cool to be a Star Wars fan. Who's a Star Wars fan in here? It's cool. I'm with you. I'm with you. Stop shaking your head, Kate. It is cool. You're wrong. Um, and so, you know, in, in Star Wars, we've got this thing, the force be with you, you know, uh, the force be with you. And sometimes people think of the Holy Spirit as just the force that's with us. But biblically, we can't really come to that conclusion. If we want to go back to these ancient documents, the Holy Spirit is always spoken of in the context of having uh, uh, attributes of personhood and is spoken of as a person. So when we think of the Holy Spirit and I say the Holy Spirit, I don't want you thinking of some magical power out there. We're speaking of the person of the Godhead that's currently present with us and residing inside of us, the Holy Spirit. Amen? If you are born again in this place, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you have repented of your sins, realized that you are never going to make it into heaven in your own merits, that you have sinned and there needs to be a price paid for that, but you know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to earth as a man. He died for your sins. If you've accepted the Jesus story and your part in that, that was for my sins, if you have surrendered your life to him and have chosen to walk with him and, and you would call yourself born again, then the good news is you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Amen? You have the Holy Spirit, even if you don't talk in rubber, rubber, rubber tongues. All right? Now, for some people here, you might have a problem with that. That's fine. I'm happy to talk outside of this morning about my theological reasons why I believe that you don't have to speak in tongues to have the Holy Spirit. I believe it's very clear biblically that we have the Holy Spirit. Billy Graham did not speak in tongues, for the record. So if anybody would like to challenge his faith, go ahead. As for me and my house, we'll leave it alone. But we, I want to continue to talk a little bit about this person of the Holy Spirit. Um, many years ago, I'm trying to remember the quote. Some of you would probably remember it. Um, uh, Salvation Army, William Booth, made this statement and he talked about what the future would look like, politics and all this stuff and religion and so on. And one of the statements he, he made was that we could end up with a church without the Holy Spirit. We could end up with a really well put together religious organisation that goes through the religious motions and so on, but we can get really, really good, and, and this is in every area of life, we can get so good and robotic at doing stuff that we don't need the playbook anymore, so to speak. We can just go through those motions. Yet, we're a part of this thing called the body that has been assembled and put together by God. You didn't create the body of Christ. I didn't create the body of Christ. The, the Holy Spirit's been putting us together. And we don't want to be people that just go through the Christian life robotically because we've been doing it for quite a while now. We've worked out how, how it works, amen? How many, of you know, how many of you know all the rules? You know, they don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And you're getting pretty good at not doing it. Who thinks they're getting pretty good at not doing it? Who reckons they're just getting pretty good at covering it up? Who reckons they're good at hiding it from the wrong people? <laughs> Everyone's getting nervous laughter there. It's okay, we're all human. We're all human. 
But we don't want to be people that are going through motions. We were never meant to go through motions. In fact, Jesus, we talked about this last week, said, I want you guys to wait in Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit, until the Spirit comes and I've released the Spirit to come and fill you. And Peter gets up and preaches this amazing sermon and thousands get saved and they receive the promise that day of the Holy Spirit as well. And the church is sort of birthed as people uh, embrace what Jesus did on the cross, receive the Holy Spirit, and then we begin to live out of that new life of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And so I want to talk a little bit more about that this morning and our relationship to and interactions with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Peter, who's preaching, makes this statement. He says to this large crowd, repent. Now, repentance is not a prayer. Repentance is an action. It's a decision. I know that, that we, we talk about repentance being just a prayer that you pray. Um, repentance back in, in Jesus' time, repentance was not a prayer you pray. You know, sometimes we think repentance is, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, but I'll turn around, but I'll stand right next to that thing. So when I feel like it again, I'll turn around and I can play with it again. Oh, sorry, Lord, I to, I'll repent. I'll to, oh, but repentance is, 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 is a change of one's mind, which leads to a change of one's actions. It's a 180. I'm over here living for myself, doing my own thing. If I truly repent, what that means is I do a 180 and I start the process of walking away from that thing. So sin for a believer should be a difficult thing to do. Amen? It's not as easy. It doesn't mean we don't sin, but I'll tell you what, when I do sin and do the wrong thing nowadays, it's way harder than it was before I came to faith. Way, way harder. Because I've got the Holy Spirit inside of me, you see. And he's pulling me away from that. And he's, he's, he's convicting and showing me that's not the best choice. That's not the way a person like you should walk. But Peter gets up and he makes this statement in this, this, this opportunity to preach to the crowds. And he says this, Acts 3.19. He says, repent therefore and be converted. That your sins may be block, blotted out or blocked out, forgiven. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I absolutely love that statement, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Who feels like in their heart, in their spirit, in their life, they would just love for that promise to come to pass in their world? Who feels like they would love a time of refreshing right now in their life? I would love a time of refreshing in my life. And Peter says that this is available to those of us that have given our lives over to Jesus and received. When he talks about that times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord, he's speaking about the presence of the Holy Spirit coming into our world. The presence of God on the earth right now is the presence of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying that, that the presence of the Holy Spirit comes into our world and can bring to us times of refreshing. I love that picture of what God gives us. That word refreshing literally means to get your breath back. It means to get your breath back. So in other words, repent, come to Christ. I'm going to give you, you'll give you the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit's going to do, he's going to help you get your breath back. Amen? Who feels like they would love to get their breath back right now? You're running uh, hard, you're running fast, you're running long, you're running into brick walls and you're bouncing off them, you're having to get yourself up, dust yourself off, run in another direction, you're tripping over your own feet, you get up, you run in another direction, somebody whacks you with a baseball bat, you get up and we're just running all up and we are tired and we are struggling and we feel like, God, where are you? What are you doing? And the promise comes to us and the Holy Spirit says, hey, I'm right here and I want to bring times of refreshing into your world. I want those times of refreshing through the presence of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit's presence makes a tangible difference in our lives. There's, there's nothing I can find anywhere in this collection of ancient documents that came out of the mouth of Jesus or any of the writers of the New Testament that gives me any reason to believe that the presence of the Holy Spirit is just like that paper cup sitting there on the seat next to Jordan right there. That paper cup is making absolutely zero difference to his life. It's just something that's there. But it's not changing him, it's not transforming him, it's not in him, it's not interacting with him, it's not doing anything, it's not guiding him, it's not leading him, it doesn't speak to him, and it's certainly not helping him get his breath back and bringing times of refreshing into his life, it's just there. Nowhere in the New Testament do we hear a description of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said, it's so important for me to go, because I have to go to send the Spirit. It's that imperative that you receive the Holy Spirit, I've got, but it's not going to come until I go. At no point did Jesus ever give us room to think that the Holy Spirit would just be a thing that's just kind of there. Our lives are different, or should be different, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. 
Uh, anyone ever gone on a trip somewhere and you, 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 get, you pack for that trip and you load the car and so on and your mentality, your thought process is when we get to that destination, boy, we're going to have some fun. And anyone relate to that? It, it feels like hard work, packing and so on. But when I get to that destination, I'm going to be able to do a whole bunch of things and experience a whole bunch of things because when I get there, a lot of people think the Christian life is like that. We're still packing things in and we're waiting for some future destination, something else, some other place. And when we get there, then we'll be able to avail ourselves of all the goodies. Then we'll be able to actually enjoy our life and so on. There'll be so many more things we're able to do when we get there. Just like going to wet and wild. When I get to wet and wild, then I can do all these things. And so many people live with the Christian life like there's some kind of destination that we're heading towards. And in one sense, there is. One day we will leave this body and we will go to eternity and we will be with God in heaven because of what Jesus did for us. That is a true thing and that's going to happen. But in terms of destination, when I gave my life to Jesus, here's the truth. I reached the destination. Jesus is the destination. I'm not waiting for something else to happen. Jesus Christ, my faith in Christ, is the destination. I receive the Spirit. I've got everything now that I need for life and godliness. It's happened in my world. It's been given to me. And instead of waiting, so many of us are waiting for something else before we feel like we can actually kick back or maybe enjoy our life or enjoy our relationship with God. We're sitting back and we're waiting for something else to happen. Some people think, if I just change churches, that'll be the answer. I'm just going to go to another church... And if I go to another church, then all of a sudden I'm going to have this you know, feeling of, oh, I've made it, I'm at that place. If we change jobs, I'm just going to go and find another job and I'll find fulfilment in that job and I'll find fulfilment over here. And I'm just going to go and then I'll have all the, you know, the stuff that I need and I'll be peaceful and I can find times of refreshing in my life. If I just change partners, you're 51 now, Jack. I only look about 40, so you know, I've got 11 years there. I go fishing, put myself out in the market. Oh, you're too good. I don't think I'd ever find anyone like you. But people think that if I just change partners, I'll get a fresh start and I'll get times of refreshing and I can have a new life and, you know, it could be all different. As soon as the kids are out of the house, anyone ever thought that? Anyone ever actually think once the kids leave home, it just becomes so much easier? Anyone think that? Yeah, yeah. Anyone had kids that leave home and you still think that? They're still your kids. You still love them. You still got relationship and life goes on. If I just get a prophetic word, if someone would just come up to me and just give me a prophetic word, that would change everything and, and, and I would start living in the destination and so on. But we get a prophetic word and, you know, and prophetic words are great and I'm all for them. But again, we're looking for something and we're waiting for something else to happen. The truth is we don't always need something else. Sometimes we need to embrace what we already have. Sometimes we've just got to embrace what we already have in life. And what I want to say to us this morning is we have this wonderful person of the Trinity... That's called the Holy Spirit, living with us, living inside of us, dwelling in us as we speak. Now, many of us want a more real real experience of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But here's the question. Are we living in a way that enhances the Spirit's interaction with us or not? Are we helping or hindering the Holy Spirit's work in our lives and through our lives? Are we helping or are we hindering the Spirit's work in our lives? Many of, us, uh, uh, many of us want that more real experience, that more... Ten- we, we want God to, 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 to do a work in our heart. I've got areas in my heart where I'm just going, God, I want you to... Ch- I can't change it myself. I can't just mentally make... It. God, I know there are deep things in here. Lord, I need you to, to do that. But am I working with the Holy Spirit to bring about that change? Am I helping or hindering his deep work in my life? I want the Spirit to move through me more. I want to walk downtown see a guy across the road called Barry, walk across the road and say, hey, your name's Barry, and have him say, how did you know? And go, well, I don't, but God did. And he told me to tell you that he loves you and if you repent. And I want to see Barry fall down in the streets weeping and shaking violently. And I want to cast a demon out of Barry. And I want to see the whole shopping center come running around and go, what's going on? You've killed him. And I want to stand up on a chair and go, this man is not dead as you would suppose, but this is the work of the Lord. You all need to repent. And I want to say to them, Give your lives to Jesus at times of refreshing. I mean, I want to do all that. Who doesn't? That's right. But here's the thing. Am I helping the work of the Spirit through my life or am I hindering the work of the Holy Spirit through my life? Romans chapter 8 verse 16 says this. It says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, what that means is that... Let me give you a, a, a spiritual biology 
We, we, we have a body, but we are a spirit. We are having an a in-body experience right now. And one day we will leave this magnificent body that we have and we will have an out-of-body, I guess, experience. Mind you, I think we're going to have a resurrected body as well. Either way, I've got some kind of body. Um, I'm just, you know, if God asks me, I'll make a few minor adjustments, but it's okay, God, it's up to you. It's up to you. But we have a spirit. And when we get born again, God's spirit is placed in our spirit. Right? So there's this intermingling of the Holy Spirit and my spirit. And what this verse is saying is that God's spirit bears witness with my spirit. In other words, they're interacting with one another. And there are moments in our lives where we get to experience and feel what the Holy Spirit is experiencing and feeling. Have you ever had a moment of pure joy that you knew came, that had nothing to do with an external circumstance, but all of a sudden joy welled up inside you and you couldn't put your finger on where that joy was coming from externally other than something deep on the inside of you? And, and, and you say, I believe that's the Holy Spirit is, is a spirit of joy. And sometimes the Holy Spirit just wells up with joy. And it's not like I don't experience that. He's in my spirit. So I experience that joy coming up out of nowhere as well. I remember one time driving down the cutting with Jackie and we were going through. There was a few things happening in the life of Arise in the early days. And there were some difficulties And we're driving down the cutting and I'm thinking about all these difficulties. Just My head is just a mess with all this pressure and stuff. I remember the moment when you get the bottom of the cutting towards Balna where it levels out. All of a sudden, something from in me welled up with joy out of absolutely nowhere. And I got this smile on my face and tears started coming down my eyes. And I'm thinking with my brain, what are you so happy about? And my spirit's going, shut up, just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. And all of a sudden, all this stuff in my head disappeared. That joy didn't, it wasn't an expression of me being joyful. I think it was the Holy Spirit going, ah, I've got a plan, I know what's going on. And the joy of God welled up inside of me because his spirit and my spirit are intertwined. His spirit witnessed with my spirit. And I felt joy. You know, I think also it can work the other way. It can work the other way too. If I can experience those really good positive feelings of the Spirit inside of me and I connect with that, I wonder when the Spirit is not feeling so joyful whether I get to experience and feel that as well. Ever ever have those moments in life where you just feel flat and defeated and under everything and all the pressures there and so on? And you run around, sometimes we run around trying to fix everything externally. Like we just talked about, if we just change this and tweak that and change that. And, and you run around doing all these things, but deep down inside you still kind of feel like something is just not right here. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, and it's just a wondering out loud. I wonder whether sometimes what's going on is it's not necessarily that the world around us needs to change. But it's the Holy Spirit inside of us saying there's something going on internally or there's something happening in your relationship with me that I'm just not quite jumping over the moon about in joy at the moment. And you can try to fix everything out there, but it's not something going on out there. It's more between you and your relationship with me. Let's stop and let's talk a little bit about that. When David wasn't living right with God, he experienced a change in his life. In Psalm 51 verse 11 to 12, here's what David said. Now, this is right smack bang in the moment, in the whole scenario of David and Bathsheba. Everyone know the story? David, he, he's on the roof at, and he looks across and he sees this really beautiful woman on the roof of the, the building next door and she's not his wife and her husband is out fighting in a battle that it says at the time when kings go out to battle, David should have been out there fighting with him. For whatever reason, he was not out there where he should have been. He was where he shouldn't be and he sees this beautiful woman and it begins a very, very sad series of events in the life of King David. He, he gets her brought over, uh, he sleeps with her, she falls pregnant. When he finds out about that, he tries to get her husband killed in battle on several occasions, uh, unsuccessfully, then finally, eventually does. And then a prophet comes to him and goes, you know what, David, here's the deal. I don't care if nobody out there knew what was going on. God knows exactly what you did and he calls him on it. And in the midst of this turmoil, this is, this is the background for Psalm 51, when David writes Psalm 51. And he says this in, in verse 11 and 12. He says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, in the Old Testament, we read of the Spirit coming down and being taken up. Holy Spirit would come upon people for tasks. 
uh, would come upon them for a battle and go, would come upon prophets, priests, and kings at different times. But the Holy Spirit's kind of like a, has this image of being like a yo yo, you know, up and down, up and down on people. In the New Covenant, the New Testament, we don't see the Holy Spirit coming up on like that. We see the Spirit in, in dwelling and living with us. Now, I don't see any evidence in the New Testament that uh, if we sin, that the Holy Spirit runs a mile from us and goes, well, forget it. You better get perfect before I come back. Who's perfect in this room? No one. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. But in the old covenant, David was afraid. God, you'll take your spirit away from me. You'll take your anointing off me and, and so on. And that was a bad thing in the Old Testament. He says this. He says, do not cast me away from your presence. Don't take your spirit from me. Then he says this. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. In other words, I've just blown it. And here's, what's, here's, here's what I'm experiencing. This is David's way of what I'm experiencing right now. If I can describe my experience to you, it's this. I don't have the joy of knowing I'm a child of God anymore. The joy that was once there, that, that, I, knew, that I knew I was a child of God, the consequence of what I've done, he's saying, can you restore that joy back to me? Because I've kind of lost the joy of knowing that I'm a child of God in this moment. And the other thing is, he said, I feel like I'm trying to do this whole journey all by myself in my own strength. So would you please uphold me by your spirit? Because I feel like I'm trying to uphold myself right now. So two things that happened when David did what he did. And two things that he felt and two ways that he observed his life being impacted by what he had done is that A, he lost the joy of knowing that he was a child of God. Anyone ever relate to that? You lose that feeling, all of a sudden it's, it's gone, you can't connect with it. Am I saved, am I not? I don't know, I've got the, it feels weird. You, you, you are saved, but you can go through those moments and you can have those times. And the other thing is he said, and I feel like I'm doing this all in my own strength. I need you to come back and uphold me by your spirit. Anyone ever feel like they're trying to do this whole Christian thing in their own strength? I can relate to both of those emotions that David is talking about. Now here's the thing. There are reasons or things that we are told in the New Testament in terms of our relationship with the Holy Spirit not to do. And if we do these things, it stands to reason that if the Holy Spirit feels that way, that him interacting with my spirit, I would feel a little bit of some of this stuff in my own world. And here are three very, very clear things that we're told in the New Testament not to do to the Holy Spirit. And if we do, we will, we'll, maybe we'll feel that in our own heart. Maybe we'll feel that in our own walk. And if we've done these things, maybe we need to acknowledge them and turn away from them and start walking in a better direction. What I want to do over the next few times I I get to stand up is I want to talk a little bit about these three things because there is context to these things as well. That's very clear in the Bible and I want us to understand the context. The first one is, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Why is the Holy Spirit able to be grieved? Because he's that person. Don't grieve the Spirit. The second one they say is do not quench the Spirit. And the third one I want to talk about is do not resist the Spirit. We're not going to cover them all today, but very quickly in the last few minutes, I want to talk about the first one, grieving the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, when we talk about grieving the Spirit, he's not talking about losing your salvation. Because he says, don't grieve the Spirit that you've been sealed with. In other words, you're sealed. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit, but you can still grieve the Holy Spirit. It's not like David where God goes, I'm going to take the Spirit completely away from you. Because if God takes the Spirit away from you when you sin, it means that you are no longer saved. You're no longer saved. You're no longer sealed. You're not going to heaven. But every time we sin, we know that God doesn't take his Holy Spirit away from us. Otherwise, we'd be in heaven, out of heaven, in heaven, out of heaven, in heaven, out of heaven, in heaven, out of heaven. And just hope that I pass from this world when I'm in heaven. Otherwise, I'm in all sorts of trouble. Right? But it doesn't work like that. We have confidence in our salvation. So when he says grieving the Spirit, he's not talking about losing salvation. But, but what he's saying is, one of the ways you'll know you've grieved the Spirit is similar to David. You will lose the joy of knowing you're a child of God, and you'll feel like you're doing this whole thing by yourself. Here are a couple of the signs. I want you to think about those two things as we talk about this different stuff. So how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? The context of Ephesians is very, very, very clear. If you go back a couple of verses, I'm going to put my, my glasses on here. If we go back a few verses and we read uh, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, back from, uh, where are we? Verse 25 onwards. Paul writes this, he says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, 
for we are members of one body. Who's he talking to and what's he talking about? He's talking to Christians who are in the body. He's saying, put all this stuff away. He's not, he, he's not saying you can lie to people that aren't Christians. That's not what he's saying. Right? So don't go, oh, excellent, so I can rely and cheat and steal out there, but I better treat the Christians a bit better. It's not what he's saying. But in the context of grieving the Spirit, this is very important. What he's doing here is he's talking about how the church should relate to the church. How should you treat fellow believers? And I don't care whether they come to this church or go to another church. I don't care whether they're a minister that you've read something about online that lives on the other side of the world. Another person who's a member of the body of Christ. This is what he's talking about. How we relate to one another. Uh, Where are we? He says, "So, so we're all members of one body. Verse 26, be angry and don't sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Remember, he's talking about the context of body. Don't give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer. Let him labor, work with his hands, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Again, he's talking in the context of the body, looking after other believers. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, for whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another. Who are the one another's? It's the body. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave who? You. He's talking about how we treat other believers in the context of grieving the spirit. So when I put that together, here's what I want to say to you. When we engage in things that disrupt the unity of God's body, i.e. the church, we grieve the Holy Spirit. When we engage in stuff that disrupts the unity of the church, we are putting ourselves in a position, according to Paul's letter and what Paul is building towards and what he's trying to say here, we're putting ourselves in a position where you're actually grieving the Holy Spirit of God. In in Ephesians 4, verse 1 to 4, he says, Therefore, I therefore, a prisoner of God, I encourage you, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, long-suffering, bear with one another in love, And he says, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Who's he talking about again? The unity of the Spirit is where? It's with the church. He's talking about the body. And it's interesting, he doesn't say make unity, he says keep it, doesn't he? Churches, we feel like we can create unity, we can't. The Holy Spirit is what creates unity, we just keep unity. Okay, we can run around thinking we've got unity because we did this program together and that program together. We don't make unity. The Holy Spirit brings us together. He's the one in control. He creates unity. We keep unity. How do we keep unity? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, not getting caught up in all the other rubbish that we get caught up on that tends to divide us and keep us apart. So he's talking about the body. Uh, and then in verse 4, he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. How many of you know that when you have children, when your children are not getting on, it grieves you as a parent, doesn't it? It grieves you as a parent because you want your kids to get on. You want your children to see the best in each other, even when you know that there's not always the best there. But you want them to believe in one another. You want them them to be cheerleaders for each other. Who who, who wants their children to grow up being cheerleaders for their siblings? We all do, every one of us. And if you don't, if you're wanting your kids to not get on, please come forward. I want to pray for you. There's something not going on well, okay? We we, we want our kids in the best of intentions of our heart. It doesn't always work out, but we want our children to grow up and actually get on and have some sense of unity. And it grieves us when we don't. And God is exactly the same. He wants his children to get on. He wants us to be able to look beyond the fact that we might not agree on everything, we might not like everything they do or the way they do, whatever, but he wants us to get on because he's a loving father, we're his children, and he cares for us. And when the children don't get on with each other because we're too busy bickering, fighting, pointing fingers, making fun of, criticizing and judging, it brings grief to the heart of the father. Have you ever heard someone say, I love Jesus, but I hate the church? Anyone ever heard that? Oh, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. And there'll be some people that'll say, well, that's okay, so long as you love Jesus. I can't find anything in there where Jesus would agree with you. And I know exactly where people are coming from when they say that, because I have been in that space myself, where I have said, I love Jesus, but you church people, get away from me, you're weird, I don't like you, you're this, you're that, and so on, until one day the Holy Spirit put a mirror up to me and went, geez, I look like a church person. (laughs) My goodness, what's going on here? I don't think you'll find any biblical evidence that Jesus would agree with that statement. 
Because Jesus loves all of his kids, even the dysfunctional ones. Hands up if you're a dysfunctional child of God. Wow, it's amazing that our Father still loves us. And his message to his children is, you know what, guys, come on. Look, you, you might be different, you might not. But hey, can you see beyond all that stuff? And can you just accept the fact that, hey, we're all in the one family here and we're all going to end up in the same place one day. And the person you hate, the person you're picking apart, you might end up standing next to them in a worship service with their hands in the air going, blah, 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 like this, and you're sitting over here and, you know. <laughs> hey, so what? If they're worshiping Jesus, so are you. If we can just focus on the right things and keep our eyes in the right direction, then we can uh, be the body, we can be the people that God wants us to be. So in the beginning, the devil didn't just separate man from God, did he? Think about this. Go back to the Garden of Eden. The devil did not just separate man from God. He also separated man from man. Adam and Eve, they started pointing fingers at each other straight away. They're both God's kids, okay? It wasn't just that they were in unity against God. All of a sudden, they weren't getting on. That woman that you gave me, God, <laughs> It's all their fault. You know? There was this unity brought about, not just from man to God, but also man to man, man to woman. There was this unity brought about by the fall. And the work of the cross was not just about reconciling us to God. There's a mystery element to it. And Paul talks about it in the book of Ephesians. In fact, the word mystery is used in the book of Ephesians more than any other writing in the New Testament. And the mystery he's talking about is this, that God through Jesus was bringing together this, there's this group of people called Jews who had a, 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 a Old Testament birthright to God and were gods. And then there's these people called Gentiles that worshipped other gods that most of us would be with Gentiles if we were back in those days. And they were far from God and, and had their own idols and so on. But neither of them, neither of those two groups were good enough to get into heaven without Jesus. And so Jesus dies on a cross and the mystery is that God then goes, I'm going to make one body out of all these dysfunctional groups of people. I'm going to bring them all together and form one body. And Paul throughout the whole book of Ephesians talks about this is a mystery. We don't get it, but I'm trying to talk to you about the mystery of it's not just us being reconciled to God, but man being reconciled to one another as well. And that all took place through the cross. Ephesians 2, 14 to 18. He himself, Jesus, is our peace. He's made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh on the cross, setting aside the law, its commands, its regulations. He set all that stuff aside, said basically your works aren't good enough. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. What's he doing? This is talking about the cross. When he died, it wasn't just you and God being reconciled. He said, I'm also ripping down that wall of hostility that's kept my children apart from one another so that they would come together. I'm actually just making one body here. Bring them together in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to to the Father by one spirit. In other words, the cross was not just reconciling you to God, it was reconciling you to each other as well. That's the mystery of God. It doesn't just stop. People think, well, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. It's just all about me and God. But the cross was more than just me and God. It was me and God and me and you. Whether you like it or not. Whether you like me or you don't like me. If we are under God together, we are brothers and sisters. And part of what uh, grieving the spirit is, is when we don't accept that, we don't walk in that, and we don't foster that. This is one of the major themes of the Ephesian letter is this concept of a mystery. See, God loves all people in the church, even the loopy parts of the church. Anyone got that weird cousin that people sort of don't get on with? Anyone got that in their family? You're not going to raise your hands because you might have family here and you'll be asked afterwards going, am I the weird cousin? Who's the weird? We've all got that weird sort of family member, the distant auntie or uncle and so on, you know, that kind of only show up, they show up at Christmas time with a, you know, a, a I don't know, yellow top hat on or, uh, or whatever it is that they do and, and they think differently to everybody else and they look differently to everybody else and their concepts and worldview is different to everybody else but hey, they're still your family, aren't they? They're still family and it doesn't matter how we treat them it doesn't matter what we think of them we can reject them and never speak to them for the rest of our life guess what? You're still linked because they're still family they're still family and God is like that with his children too. There's, there are all kinds out there and I have no doubt there are weird Christians you've met and weird churches you've been to and weird practices and people do things in weird ways. In this place here, people do some things in weird ways. I talk to weird people, I'm looking at weird people, you're looking at a weird person, okay? But we're still one body. We're still one body. 
And when we get to the place of criticizing and judging and pointing fingers and poking and so on, we get into the realm where we begin ourselves to grieve the Holy Spirit. No wonder how many of us have, done, have taken that kind of stuff so lightly that we don't even realize now that some of the sadness we feel inside, we can't seem to shake. Some of that, 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 that burden that we carry around all the time, it doesn't matter what we do out here, it doesn't lift. I wonder whether for some of us that's because the Spirit is grieved inside of us. But we've gotten so comfortable making fun of other churches and other believers. We've gotten so comfortable pointing fingers at that one when their sin's exposed and that one when their sin's exposed. We've gotten so comfortable with it that we haven't realized over time the Spirit's just gotten sadder and sadder and sadder and we've grieved the Holy Spirit because we failed to recognize the mystery of the body of Christ, that we are all one. Triple C, Baptist, Anglican, uh, I don't care who you are, what your background is, we, we are all one in Christ. and We're meant to acknowledge that. Very quickly... I'll give you a quick look at what happens with this type of disunity in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 to 13, uh, uh, Paul's writing to the Corinthian believers. Here's what he says. He says, I plead with you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, they all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Here we go. We're going, we know straight away he's going to be talking about something that's brought division amongst God's children. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brothers, by those of Chloe's household, there are contentions among you. And here's what the contentions are. Some of you are saying, I'm of Paul. Some are saying, I'm of Apollos. Some are saying, I'm of Cephas, Peter. Some are saying, I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized into the name of Paul? Where it says there, I am of, here's what it literally means. It literally means, I am the possession of. In other words, I am owned by. I am owned by Paul. We can do that. I am owned by this particular worship style. And anything other than that is wrong. I am owned by this particular preaching style. Anything other than that is wrong. I am owned by this particular denomination. If it happens outside of it, it's wrong. I am owned by this particular style of liturgy. When you come to church, you, you stand and sit and read from a book. or you, yeah, I'm, I, I'm owned by this way of doing communion. I'm owned by... We can do the exact same thing. And what it does is it breeds this unity. Because when we get to that point... Now, there's nothing wrong with having preferences. Paul's not saying to them here, nothing wrong with preferences of styles. Who has a preferred style of worship? I do. But you know what? I can find God in other styles of worship. Don't you worry. I'm not sitting in other styles... Going in my heart, Jesus, they didn't do it like we do. I wish they had done it like we do back at a rise. As soon as you're doing that, what are you doing? It's revealing that somewhere inside of you, you're owned by that. You're owned, don't be owned by that. Be owned by Jesus. Be owned by Jesus. You sit there with a preacher and you're sitting there and you're judging the, the way that he's speaking and his style. Oh, man, his style is so boring. He gets up with a suit and a tie and he just stands there and, just, and, and you start judging that. And the minute you start judging that, you clock off to God. You're not, you're not hearing from the Spirit through this person. It's just their style. What are you doing? You're saying that I've owned that style. That style owns me and that style is wrong. There's nothing wrong with preferences, but there's a point where our preference allows us and almost encourages us and gives us the right to become critical and judgmental of another style or another way of doing things. That's when we have gone way too far. And that's what Paul is talking about here in Ephesians. He says, you grieve the spirit when you don't treat other believers the appropriate way that you should as members of your own family. And that's what's going on here in Corinth. How does it outwork? Well, it outworks in some bizarre ways sometimes. Just very quickly, here's some things that... Uh, there was a survey done recently about reasons why people leave churches and split churches, right? And if you were part of this church I'm reading about, I apologise. I don't know, didn't know that you were part of it, but here's some things, right? There was an argument over the appropriate length of the worship pastor's beard. People argued in church. There was a big argument. Uh, these, these are real stories from a survey that was done a few years ago. They argued over the length of the worship pastor's beard, or lack of beard, Daniel. There was a church argument and a vote to decide if a clock in the worship centre should be removed. The church argued over a clock. Uh, uh, they, 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 they had factions and splits and the keep the clock faction and the, get, and the get rid of the clock faction. It's a clock, for goodness sake. It tells the time, you know? There was a 45-minute heated argument over the type of filing cabinet to purchase, black or brown, and whether it should be two, three or four drawer. Really, it's just bizarre that believers in Christ, we would fight over this stuff to the point where we would have such strong opinions and preferences that we would allow churches to split and divide over this kind of stuff. There was a fight over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. No mention of who took the picture, but there was a fight over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. There were two different churches, two different churches reported fights over the type of coffee 
In one of the churches, they moved from one brand called Folgers to a stronger Starbucks brand. In the other church, they simply moved to a stronger blend. Members left the church in the second example. Members left the church. If, look, let me tell you something. If you're coming here because of the coffee, leave now. We don't have good coffee. It's just a fact. Everybody knows it. Our coffee sucks. But come here for Jesus. Come here for the people. Do not come here for the coffee. Okay? But look, I'm not saying we're not open to better coffee. If you've got an idea and a vision for coffee, come and, come and talk to us. There was an argument on whether churches should allow deviled eggs at the church meal because it's deviled eggs. Seriously, churches split over this stuff. These are actual fights and splits in, in churches. There was a disagreement over using the term pot luck instead of pot blessing. It's a pot blessing dinner, not a pot luck. There's no luck about it. You're blessed. Man, seriously. Some church members left the church because one church member hid the vacuum cleaner from them. It resulted in a major fight and a church split because someone hid the vacuum. Who's come in here to do the cleaning and you can't find the vacuum? I have. Does that mean I should leave? It should be, by the way, in that cupboard. Sometimes it's in that cupboard or something. People leave their churches and split and fight with one another. As fellow believers, we allow disunity because we can't find a vacuum. Seriously. I think that kind of stuff grieves the spirit. Come on, people. It's irrelevant. It's secondary. And there was an argument over whether the fake, dusty plants should be removed from the podium. These ones aren't dusty. Whoever cleaned last year did a great job. And of course, sometimes it's done in more spiritual ways. We criticise different worship preferences. We criticise different preaching styles, different liturgical forms, and so on. We don't want to be people that grieve the Holy Spirit. And when Paul talks about grieving the Spirit in Ephesians 4, that is the exact context that he's talking about. I know we say we grieve the Spirit when we sin. Yep, yep, I've got no doubt we do. But the Holy Spirit, who compiled this collection of documents, put it together a certain way with a certain context. And he wants us to know that when I'm saying don't grieve the Spirit, what I'm saying to you is be very, very careful how you talk about and how you treat fellow believers. Whether they're sitting next to you in church on Sunday, whether you read about them in a magazine, whether you saw a news story on TV, but you only saw one side of a story and you only saw what was going to be sensationalised. And, and of course in the media, you only saw what makes the church look stupid. That's all you're getting. You're not getting the full story and the full context. All right. So I want to urge us and encourage us, and we're going to talk about the other two things in the next few weeks, but I just want to encourage you, if you're in this place now, and you, 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 maybe as I'm talking, you're starting to go, oh, you know what, yeah, I'm, I could, I maybe that could. One of the signs that David said that you have grieved the Spirit, he said you'll feel those two things. You'll feel this lack of joy of the fact that you are a child of God. And you'll also feel like you are trying to uphold yourself and do everything in this Christian life in your own strength. So maybe you're here today and maybe you've been feeling that way. And maybe you've been looking to change everything out there because that'll all change it. Maybe the Holy Spirit's saying to you today, you're looking in the wrong spot. You've grieved me with your attitudes towards other church members, your attitudes towards the broader church, your, your criticism, your judgment, and so on. Can I encourage you this morning? Times of refreshing can come from the Lord. All you've got to do is humbly repent and say, Lord, you know what? God, you got me. I, I, I didn't know it. I didn't realize it at the time, but Lord, you have got me. And God, I'm sorry. And I make a choice now. I'm going to turn from that I'm going to walk in a different direction. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to be a part of the, the breeding of disunity amongst your children. I'm going to choose to be a breeder of unity and bring your body together. Because when Jesus died on that cross, part of what he did was he was forming and bringing together a body. And I don't want to work against the power of the cross. Amen? I don't want to work against what Jesus is doing. So if that's you in this place this morning, can I encourage you? Just at some point, uh, maybe after the service today, you might want to grab someone and say, you know what? I really feel like you know, the Spirit's saying something to me there. Would you pray with me? You might want to grab someone and, and it might not be them. You, know, you might want to grab someone and say, look, can I just pretend you're the broader church? I just want to speak out. I am sorry for the way I've judged and criticized and so on. Just use them as a, a bit of a focal point. Um, but can I encourage you, don't just get up and walk away and move on to the next thing today. When the Spirit speaks to us, let's work with the Holy Spirit, not hinder the Holy Spirit in what he's doing in and through our lives. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, I want to thank you for uh, this morning, Lord. I, I want to thank you, God, that times of refreshing, that is your heart, that is your desire, that is your will, that times of refreshing would come from the presence of God in our lives. Lord, you don't want your children walking around with this 
heavy feeling of being disconnected from you, God. It's not your will. God, you don't want your children walking around feeling like we are trying to do this Christian thing all in our own strength and in our own efforts. That was never, ever the original deal. So Father, if there are people here this morning, and any of us, Lord, if we have grieved your Holy Spirit, Father, I pray, would you highlight that? Would you show us in our hearts what we have done? And Lord, lead us to that, that, that great gift of repentance this morning. Father, that we can clear the way, God, that we can, uh, God, return, have that joy of our salvation return to us, Lord, and, be, and know that we are being upheld by your generous spirit, as David said, Father. So Lord, I just pray for each person here, God, speak to us, change us, challenge us. And Lord, let us not get up and just walk away. Show us, Lord, that maybe today is the day to do business with you. And Father, for the, the week ahead, God, I pray that you would go with us. Lord, I pray, God, that you would give us the opportunity. There are people in our community that do not know you yet. God, they're wandering around without hope. They're wandering around out there without direction. Jesus, you give them hope, direction. You did something 2,000 years ago, not just for us in this room, but you did it for them as well. Lord, would you give us the opportunity to go and tell some of them about the great work of the cross through Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody here said? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys.